Hey, good morning. Good morning. Isn't it good to be back in church? Come on. <laughs> I keep saying Zoom might be a good plan B, but it's not as good as plan A. Yeah, it's good. Being in the house of God together. I've been saying for a while, <clears throat> it's been like being locked up in prison, isn't it? But if I'm going to do the time, I'm going to do the crime. I'll go and throw a brick through a shop window or something. <laughs> but praise God, we're in the house of God together again and able to serve the Lord together. Hallelujah. Let's just pray for a moment, can we? Just close your eyes. Father, we thank you today that you are our Father. You are our God. There is no one like you. You are beyond all, above all, and we surrender all to you. Father, we just pray today that you will take our lives and use us for your glory, for your purposes, and for your praise. Minister to us, we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. We surrender everything to you right now. We love you today, Lord. We want you to know that. Lord, we love you today. Hallelujah. Just tell the Lord you love him for a moment, will you? Lift your heart and just tell him you love him. You know, when <clears throat> the Apostle John was an old man like me, he was about 80 years of age, and he had been sent to the Isle of Patmos in exile. He was in a, a horrible situation. Patmos was a Roman penal colony. It was a little island, only about 15 kilometers by 6 kilometers. And he was in exile alone there. Desolate, hard, hopeless situation. This occurs about now 60 years after the ascension of Jesus and the Roman Emperor Domitian ordered a great persecution of the churches of the Christians. His ambition was to wipe Christianity out. And of course the Christian population was relatively very small at that time. Just a handful of churches and, and not very, very many believers. And so you can imagine what was going on in the heart and the mind of poor old Apostle John. What was going to be happening to his beloved churches, to his friends, his brothers and sisters in this time of horrendous persecution. But you know, it is wonderful to me that God can turn hopeless situations into God's appointments for our lives and turn places of darkness into places of light and hope. Suddenly, God steps in and changes everything. But the important thing was, Jesus came where John was on the island of Patmos, but he didn't come so much to change the circumstances, he came to change John. And that is what God so often wants to do in our lives, in our situations. We often are praying, Lord, change this, do that, manipulate this, and sort that out. But, you know, most of the time, God is much more interested in changing what's going on in here. And he will use those situations to help us and to change us. The encouraging thing to know is that Jesus always knows our address and our circumstances. He's always our good shepherd. You might be locked up on a little tiny rocky island. Jesus knows exactly where you are. You might be in a den of lions. Jesus knows exactly where you are. You might be locked up in a Roman prison like Paul and Silas, but Jesus knows exactly where you are. Hallelujah. No matter how dark our situation or how bad our situation might seem to us, there are no barriers to God finding us. Hallelujah. Man can do what he wants to do, but he cannot stop God finding us. And whatever situation you find yourself in today, 
know this. God knows about it. He knows where you are. Is the situation. You might be battling with situations where perhaps you've lost your job or fearful of losing your job. All these things are so prevalent in our society today, aren't they? <clears throat> I was saying to a sister this morning, you know, there is a great fear in the country. I say we need to be wise, but I refuse to take on fear. The enemy wants to use the current situation to bring so much fear into the hearts and minds of people. But as children of God, we can be content in knowing this, that God knows and God is able to use every situation for my good, for the praise of his name and for the good of his kingdom. Hallelujah. And that is a great comfort. He is still your shepherd. Doesn't matter what is going on, he is still your shepherd. And he is committed to you. He is committed to you as the good shepherd was committed to his sheep. It's a wonderful thing, you know, even in that situation, John starts in the book of Revelation and he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I'm not sure how he even knew it was the Lord's day because all the days merge into one another, don't they, when you're in that kind of situation. But he was in a bad situation, a dark situation of fear and concern for the people of God, but he was in the Spirit. Do you come to the house of God in the Spirit? Or do you wait for somebody to pump you up, as it were, and, and bring the fire of God down? We should be, I've always said this, when we are coming to church, I believe as we are coming to church, before we come to church, we should be saying, Lord, I want to be in the Spirit when I walk in this place. I want to bring the presence of God with me. I want to bring something to the house of God. I want to bring praise and glory to your name. I'm not a passenger in this bus. We are all part and parcel of it. And I love this. John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. <clears throat> he was not bitter. When you're in those kind of situations like the apostle John was in, it's very easy to become bitter, isn't it? John did not know that two years later, this wicked emperor Domitian would die and he would be released back to his beloved people in, in the church in Ephesus. He did not know that he would be so empowered and changed by what he was going to receive on this island of Patmos that later then he would write the Gospel of John and the letters of John, which were so different from all the other writings in the New Testament. He did not know that the history of the world was going to be impacted by what he was going to receive in that place. And friends, when we are in dark situations, you do not know what you're going to receive from God. But God can use the dark situations to bring something into your life that you would not have received had it all been light and plain sailing. Trust God. That, I believe, is so important in this time in which we are living, is to say, God, I trust you. Whatever comes, I trust you. It's interesting, isn't it? In chapter 1 of the book of Revelations, you might have gathered we're going there. <clears throat> In chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, I, John, both your brother and companion, notice what he says, in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He was saying, basically, we're all in this together. It's the kingdom... It's the tribulation and it's the patience. You know, we need patience with God sometimes because God does not do things when we want, how we want. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever found that? You say, God, can I have this today? And God says, no, you can have it tomorrow. <laughs> and we say, why? Ever found that? But John said he was there... 
as their brother and companion in the tribulation. <clears throat> Interesting to see this, isn't it? He did not pray against the tribulation. The people of that time were going through something, a tribulation as great as anything this world is ever going to see. People go on about the great tribulation. These people living in that time when this emperor was trying to exterminate Christianity, were, you could not have gone through a worse tribulation than they were going through. And the interesting thing I see is that he did not pray against the emperor. He did not pray against the tribulation. And we're going to look at this, <coughs> excuse me a little bit, because there's so much I want to pick out in this wonderful book, the book of Revelations. He said he was, in fact, let me just run through a quick list of what he picked out. In chapter 2 and verse 2, he comes to this understanding, and this is the heading of the book. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, he had walked with him for three years. He'd seen the crucifixion. He'd seen the resurrection. He'd seen the ascension. But this was a unique and totally different revelation of Jesus Christ to this wonderful old man of God. In chapter 2 and verse 2, he sees him as the one who knows. Oh, hallelujah. God knows. God knows. In chapter 3 and verse 20, he sees him as the one who knocks. In chapter 4 and verse 1, he's the one who stands at the door. I'm going to move quickly through these for a moment. In chapter 5 and verse 5, he is the one who prevails. In chapter 5 and verse 6, he is the one who was slain. In verse 7, he is the one who seizes the scroll. In 14 and verse 1, he is the one who stands as victor. Hallelujah. In 14 verse 16, he is the one who reaps the harvest. And in, verse, in chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, he is the one who rules with the sword. Hallelujah. John had this amazing new revelation of Jesus Christ in all of these. Oh, bless your heart. I've got a, listen, I've got a cold. It's not COVID. I tell you what, it's a wonderful way of getting through the queue at the checkout, though. <laughs> Just cough and the waters part like the Red Sea. <laughs> wonderful. But you see, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that changes things. And this is what is so important. He saw not the promises. He saw the person. And I feel that is so important in our lives. It is what John saw in the Spirit that day, not just the words, it's the person. That is so important. That changed him. That empowered him that gave him this new understanding, when he actually just saw him, when the revelation of who Jesus Christ is today really came upon him in that wonderful way. You know, we worked with Brother Osborne, as you know, for 18 years. And what became the foundation of his ministry and revolutionized his whole life. I'll just read it because the Lord appeared to him one day. And very interesting, the Lord actually never said anything to him. But this is what he said. He wrote this. He said, the next morning at six o'clock, I was awakened by a vision of Jesus Christ as he walked into our room. I saw him like I see anyone. No tongue can describe his splendor and beauty. No language can express the magnificence and power of his person. I lay there as one who was dead, unable to move a finger or a toe, 
awestruck by his presence. Water poured from my eyes, though I was not conscious of weeping, so mighty was his presence. Of all I had heard and read about him, the half had not been told me. His hands were beautiful. They seemed to vibrate with creativity. His eyes were the streams of love pouring into my innermost being. His feet, standing amidst clouds of transparent glory, seemed to be as pillars of justice and integrity. His robe was white as light. His presence, enhanced with love and power, drew me to him. After perhaps 30 minutes, I was able to get to the floor where I crawled into my little study room and lay on my face until the afternoon. When I came out of that room, I was a new man. Jesus had become the master of my life. I knew the truth. He is alive. He is more than a dead religion. My life would change. I would never be the same. Old traditional values began to fade and I felt a new and increasing sense of reverence and serenity. Everything was different. I wanted to please him. That is all that mattered since that unforgettable morning. You know, <clears throat> that became the basis of their ministry. He always argued that he had no gifts of healing. But he had such an understanding of the power and the majesty of Jesus. All he had to do was preach his word. And God would honor his word. And with John, you see, John was in this dire situation. But everything changed that morning when he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And suddenly it seemed like the veil was pulled back. And he was caught up in the spirit and began to behold the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. In chapter 1 and verse 7 and verse 8, he said, Behold, he is coming, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That word behold means much more than, oh yeah, I just see. It means to suddenly see. And you know, when you suddenly get those moments and you suddenly say, oh, now I see. Now I understand. That's what that means. When he says, behold, look at him, understand him. He says, we beheld his glory in the gospel. He said, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. That is why John, after he had seen this glorious manifestation of Jesus Christ, he began to understand a number of things. Today, as we are living in these days, there are so many people who are so taken up with the book of Revelations, with the, the meaning and the imagery of the vials and the trumpets and the seals, and they write books about what this is and that is and the other is. Most of them don't know what they're talking about, but they're so caught up with it all. John was not caught up with those things. He was caught up by the God who was pouring out his purpose is upon earth that God was going to clean up this earth. And those who had mocked him and those who had judged him and those who had crucified him, those who had ignored him, would one day go to behold him. And when they see him in his glory, as he really is, they will call upon the rocks to cover them. They will hide in caves at the terror of the greatness of our God. Friends, I believe, somebody wrote a book, something about this. These are the strategies of Satan in these days. I couldn't care less about strange strategies. I'm much more interested in what God's doing and what God has to say because God has the last word. It's all in God's hands. It's not in Satan's hands. It's more important for us to understand what is God saying to his church in these days. 
And we need to get this same kind of revelation of the greatness and the glory of our God and Jesus Christ, our Savior, than bothering about what Satan is up to. I couldn't care less. I'm much more interested in what is Jesus doing. What does the Holy Ghost want to do? What is God's plans and intentions for his church? Because he is the one that we are called to know. If you look in, in chapter 1 and verse 17 and 20, it is the king who holds the churches. The church is his. The church belongs to him. Important to understand that. The mission, the emperor thought he could wipe the church out, but he did not understand. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. It is his church. It is not pastor's church, our church. It's his church. And God will honor his church. And God will accomplish his will and plans and purposes regardless of what man or devils or Satan can do. Hallelujah. We need to get our eyes on him. In verse 18, he is the one who holds the keys. People talk as though Satan holds the keys. He does not hold the keys. Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades. Hallelujah. He holds the authority. The keys represent the authority. And Jesus took the authority. And the keys are in his hands. Hallelujah. They are not in Satan's hands. Don't get caught up with Satan or the works of Satan. These things are going to come upon the earth. Jesus said, as the coming of the Lord draws near, there will be pestilences. There will be famines. There's a massive famine going on across India, Pakistan, and now into China from tremendous plague of locusts. There are going to be wars and rumors of wars, because Jesus said so. There is going to be lawlessness. There is going to be men's hearts failing them for fear. But he didn't say, get your eyes on those things. He's saying, get your eyes on God in the midst of those things. Because God is going to work out his plans. In verse 19 of chapter 1, the secrets of the future belong to him. He already knows. That's a good thing to know, isn't it? God already knows the end. Because he planned it. Ha <laughs> ha. Glory. Satan didn't plan it. God planned it. God ordained it. And the world is going to be a rocky old place, I tell you. When, you know, people get the idea of when we come out of COVID, everything's going to be hunky dory, lovely and sunny again. It is not. But don't get worried about it. Don't get anxious about it. Keep your eyes on Him who sits upon the throne, who holds all things in his hands. Get an idea of the greatness and glory and majesty and power of our Savior. Hallelujah. In chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13, <clears throat> he walks among the candlesticks. The candlesticks, he said, represent the churches. Do you know when Jesus... When you come to church, Jesus comes to church. If we really got a revelation on that, it would not change our services, wouldn't it? If you got a real, if suddenly it was like turning on the screen and you suddenly saw Jesus physically actually standing here, what would you do? Hey? What would we do? Seriously, what would we do? Well, I think most of us would be on our faces like John in the Isle of Patmos. But that is the issue. He is here. He is here. And yet we act as though he's not. He is here. Oh, if we could get that revelation of the greatness. He says he walks amongst the candlesticks, amongst the churches to weigh them, to observe them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He doesn't come just to play games. He doesn't come to waste his time. He comes with a plan and a purpose. 
He is the one who ministers to the church. He observes. He corrects. He commends. He encourages them. I used to say to our church sometimes, you know the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches there? And in each one of them, he analyzed them, didn't he? He pointed out their strengths and their weaknesses. He commended them for some things and he, and he brought a word of, just, of judgment, really, on some things. I used to say to our church, if Jesus wrote a letter to our church in Hockley, what would he write? Hmm? If Jesus wrote a letter to this church, what would he write? You know, I mean, to the church at Laodicea, he said, you think you are rich and have need of nothing. That was their estimation. He said, but I see you poor and blind and great and naked. You know, if Jesus wrote that letter to us, I wonder what way he would say to us. But he, he, he urges, the, one common factor amongst them all, he urges them to not use the world's standards of judgment, to use his standards of looking at things and judging things. In chapter 3 and verse 7, John sees him as the one who opens the door. He is the one that opens the door. No one can shut it. And that applies to your life, you know. When God wants you to be somewhere, he can open doors for you and no one can shut it. Hallelujah. And he can shut doors and no one can open it. I tried to move jobs for months and God kept shutting every door. He can shut doors as well until the right time came along for him and the door opened for us to work with T.L. Osborne. God can open and shut doors. Hallelujah. He's on the throne. He can do these things. In chapter 3 and verse 19 and 20, he rebukes and chastens his people. He says, I'm knocking. You know, we quote that scripture as though it's to unsaved people. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's actually saying it to a church. Will you let me in? Will you let me in? I'm knocking. I've got something for you. Do we hear his knock? Or are we so engrossed in our programs and what we think and what we are determined to do that we do not hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? Knocking, can I come in? Can I come in? When he comes to church, do you think he comes to do something? I do. I think he wants to come and do something in our lives. Beyond just healing us, you know, our eyes are always focused kind of on the physical healing, aren't they? That's good, there's nothing wrong with that. But there is something much greater. It's what he wants to do in our hearts and lives. It's the way he wants to change us. You see, what happened with John on the Isle of Patmos is the, ch the circumstances didn't change. When this glorious vision left him, he was still on the Isle of Patmos in exile, in the darkness, for another two years. But he was different. He was changed. He had this glorious truth now burning in his heart. And that is why he wrote his gospel so differently. John, when he wrote his gospel, he wasn't interested in writing about the genealogy of Jesus like uh, Matthew and Luke. He wasn't interested in being it all in nice chronological order like, you know, all the miracles and the events and everything he said. He wasn't interested in that. He just wanted to go straight to the heart of the matter that this is God who walked among us and we beheld his glory. This is God who clothed himself with humanity. And that is why the Gospel of John is so different from the others because he was writing it having had this glorious revelation of Jesus as he is now in glory. Hallelujah. This is the glory that Jesus put aside when he came down to earth and clothed himself with humanity. But he took it up again when he went back to heaven. And that is the Savior we shall see. 
Hallelujah. This is the one that we're going to see, friends. This is the one we serve. This is the one we love and adore, and that's why when we come, we should worship him passionately. You know, when you see people in a football crowd or a cricket crowd or something else, the passionate way they celebrate a goal or whatever, <clears throat> how much more passionate should we be about praising our Savior? If we really see him and understand him, hallelujah. In chapter 4 and verse 1, he is the door to the throne of God. Thank God that door has been flung open. But in chapter 5 and verse 1, he is the one, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> just say it's not COVID. <coughs> he is the one who opens the scroll. John goes into this great lament. As he sees, there was no one worthy to open the scroll. The scroll was a Roman way of writing a will. And it was sealed by the witnesses. And only the witnesses could open it, break the seals and open it. And really, it represents God's plan and will for his kingdom to come to earth. And there had been, during those years, no prophet, no priest, no king, who was found worthy, able, righteous enough, holy enough to open that scroll and bring the will of God to earth. And John lamented and wept. But he saw, he said, there was one who was found worthy. Jesus Christ was found worthy to open the scroll to bring the kingdom of God to earth. Do you know, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man 42 times. He wants the kingdom of God to come to earth. Hallelujah. And he came to bring God's plan, God's will to earth. No one was found worthy until then, but John wept until he had this revelation that Jesus Christ was found worthy Oh, hallelujah. Do you want to have a look at it with me? <clears throat> John wept there in, in chapter 4, in chapter 11, I'm sorry. He weeps to see the kingdom of God come. If you, this will take me a minute. Oh, I don't like doing this. Why do I do this? Yeah, oh, we're getting there. Somebody's got it. And he reads it out. You know, what is contained in those scrolls <clears throat> is all the judgments of God which is coming upon the earth. <clears throat> There's a lot of debate around in the church about where we are in all of these. Are we in the vials? Are we in the... <clears throat> Forget it. Don't. Get your eyes upon those things. Get your eyes upon him who sits upon the throne, whose name is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who is going to clean up this old earth and deal with all the sin and all the evil and darkness upon it. You know, I saw a sign. It was in a crowd of demonstrators the other day, one of these demonstrations going on. And I thought, isn't the heart of man incredibly wicked? The sign said, if Jesus comes again, let's crucify him again. True. And I thought, you know, I don't know. It's just the thinking, but... When Jesus was on the cross, one of the things that must have broken his heart, I think, as much as anything else, was to see the hatred and the evil in the heart of man that would crucify the Lord of glory. His own creation, the hatred and the evil, so poured out, so manifested, 
Thank God he is going to clean up this earth. And there will be a new heaven. And there will be a new earth because God has ordained it. And in that new earth, there will be nothing of evil and darkness. He is going to deal with it all. As the coming of the Lord draws near, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let fear take a grip of you when you see things that are yet to come upon this earth. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. He sits upon the throne. Hallelujah. No one in history could do what Jesus did. But Jesus prevailed for us. And then, oh, I must read this. Go to chapter 5. Where are we? Chapter 5 and verse 9. Now, I'm going to read it all. I just love reading this. This is all right, Pastor. Chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. That's the scroll. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. As though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints." And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne forever and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever. Praise cascading through heaven. Praise cascading through earth. Oh, that the heavens and the earth would sing the song of the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, who has redeemed us to our God and made us kings and priests to him. Oh, friends, you know, it's an amazing thing. when you th- Can you picture that song? Thousands and tens of thousands of thousands all worshipping. Do you think they were sitting there and doing it half-heartedly? No. Absolutely not. They sang a new song. Oh, that anthem is going to resound around this world. Hallelujah. Satan's reign will end. John wrote in 1 John 1.4, after he'd seen all this, 
These things I write unto you, that your joy may be full. Isn't that interesting? He never mentions, doesn't bother about Domitian or all that was going on, all the hardship, all the adversaries and all the things against the church. His eyes were just full of Jesus. And he said, I'm writing all of this so that when you're in the midst of this persecution, when you're in the midst of the darkness, your joy might be full. Do you know we should be joyful people? In the midst of COVID or any other plague or anything else that's going on, we should be people of joy. He's, John gives a reason <clears throat> for the joy. Full joy, not just a bit of it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, this is John, Gospel of John, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands of handle concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. That's what he understood. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us. That which we have seen and we have heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father. And with the Son. Hallelujah. What he is saying to them in John Gospel there, he said this. Divinity took on dust. If your mind can comprehend that. Infinity became finite. This, you see, when he, was, he had this tremendous conflict going on. He remembered the Jesus that had walked around. But he also saw the Jesus that's on the throne of God in heaven. The infinite took on infinite. The creator became a child. Majesty clothed in humility. Oh, what a saviour we have. The immortal became mortal. Who can comprehend such things? The unapproachable now available to all mankind. The invisible made visible. This is our God, friends. This is our God. And at the end of it all, in that amazing revelation that John had on the Isle of Patmos, he sees the conclusion. All the vileness and the wickedness and the evil and the filth and the degradation of this world, every demonic power and Satan himself judged and cast into hell, and a new heavens and a new earth in which dwells righteousness. And he saw us there with him, singing the song of the redeemed. Hallelujah. When you get your eyes on that, the trials and the tribulations of this life, which are real, they are real, but they are small by comparison. Because God, almighty God, this glorious manifestation of God holds us. He is our shepherd. He holds us in his hand. He will never let us go. He is the good shepherd that laid down his life for the sheep. And oh, we are his precious treasure. Get your eyes on the glory of who Jesus really is now. If there's one thing that we should be praying, I believe, it is to say, Lord, open my eyes. That my eyes will not have an image of Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. You know, so many people have still got that impression of Jesus. He is the mighty one sitting upon the throne of eternity. He holds all things in his hands. He has declared what will be, and no man or devil can stop him in his glorious purpose. And his purpose is that he will have a glorious church. Oh, hallelujah. And this one is our God forever and ever and ever and ever. And we shall sing the song of the redeemed. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain and has redeemed us to God by his blood. 
Hallelujah. Oh, friends, we should be excited about the future. Don't be taken up by the, the stuff that's going to be happening. It's going to happen, but it's going to come to pass. But Jesus is on the throne. Hallelujah. Let him fill your vision. When you come to church, come to worship this one. Don't get caught up in all the imagery of revelations. There's so much there that's so hard for us to understand. But one thing I know, he saw the one who is in glory, and we shall see him face to face. Hallelujah. Do you love him this morning? Do you worship him this morning? Lord, we love you today. We bow before you, Lord, and we give our lives utterly and totally to you. Lord, we thank you that you came to bring us to this wonderful God, wonderful counselor, mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Do you need him this morning to touch you? We'd love to pray with you. Getting a hand back over to the pastor. But he is here. This one is here. He comes to church with us. Hallelujah. We're not praying to him in heaven a million miles away. He's here. He's here. He's here. His name is here. His power is here. His glory is here. Yeah, what a great word, Pastor Miles. Thank you so much. Yeah, praise the Lord. I pray that um, you have a greater revelation.